Well, good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. We are very glad that you're here this morning. It's been a few weeks since I've been up here, so I've been combing the internet. And this today is things that were actually found in church bulletins. Remember, I did not write these. Someone that works for a church did this. Well, I, I, I work for a church, but somebody that works for other churches did this. First one, Bertha Belch. That's a great name. A missionary from Africa will be speaking tonight at Calvary Memorial Church in Racine, Wisconsin. Come tonight and hear Bertha Belch all the way from Africa. That's a good one. The peacemaking meeting scheduled for today has been canceled due to a conflict. Think about it. Barbara remains in the hospital and needs blood donors for more transfusions. She is also having trouble sleeping and requests tapes of Pastor Jack's sermons. A bean supper, a bean supper, a bean supper will be held on Tuesday evening in the church hall. Music will follow. These are so good. Oh. For those of you who have children and don't know it, we have a nursery downstairs. Oh. So good. So good. Oh. And the last one is, and, and I got pastoral approve, approval on this one. <laughs> the associate pastor will be preaching a sermon on stewardship called, I upped my pledge, now up yours. <laughs> oh, that's such a good one. For those of you who didn't get that one, find Pastor Nathan after church. He'll, he'll speak with you, he'll pray for you. Oh, great. So now a few announcements. The first one, has a short little video. So we'll watch the video first. It's about VBS. Get it? Skip on over to VBS this week. That is the humor, my friends, of Terry Perry. So VBS is this week, Monday through Friday, 5.45 to 7.45 at Clenmore. It is not too late to sign up your kids. Hey, it's not even too late to sign up to help. Um, Terry did text me this morning from Michigan. There is a need for orange cones. If you have the big ones from the road or the little ones for soccer or whatever, if you have any orange cones, we need them. So if you could bring them to church tomorrow or just show up at Clenmore tomorrow with them, that would be really great. The summer reading program begins today. You can sign up in Galbraith Hall and dive in for reading treasures. That is the theme this year, so jump in, grab some books from the church library and start reading this summer. And next Sunday is our annual worship in the park and church picnic at Pearson Park, shelter number five, back in the corner by the ball field where we've been every year. Um, Please bring a side dish or a dessert to, ch to share. Bring a lawn chair to sit on. Um, the meat and the table service will all be provided and drinks. So please put that on your calendar. Every year it's been a fun time and a great event for us as a church. So come on out next Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. <clears throat> the activities committee is still hosting their kitchen shower for the church kitchen and they're asking you to help purchase new dish cloths and towels and pot holders. Um, there's a basket in Galbraith Hall for your donations. You'll see it when you walk out. It's full, which is a great thing. Parents of youth group kids, we have a meeting following worship today up in the senior high room, so please say hello to everybody for a few minutes, hang out, but then come up. Our meeting will be a half hour or so, not a very long one. Okay, that is all for me. Sandy Earl is doing a moment for mission for a World Vision Workday. Sandy Earl.
Hi, I'm head of the mission committee this year, and we are having a work team. How many of you want to work for the Lord? Really, raise your hand. Want to work for the Lord? I have an opportunity for you, a perfect opportunity. If you are free on Monday, June 30th, it was put wrong in the bulletin a couple of times, at the end of this month, on a Monday, we are going to congregate in the parking area, and we are going to carpool down to where they are packing for World Vision. World Vision is an organization that uh, works with uh, developing countries. They collect shoes and clothing. We're going to organize and pack for them, and they'll send them off to these developing countries to help them. We're going to be, uh, they start from ni at nine o'clock, and we'll be done about noon, so we'll go out to lunch. You have to provide your own money for that. Um, but it'll be a great opportunity, a lot of fun, and it's from uh, people 11 and up to go work. So if you're interested, you can see me or uh, Chad and sign up. And uh, we have a number of spaces available. Uh, please come in and help us work. Thank you. Please stand as you are able and join me in a responsive call to worship and the unison opening prayer. The Spirit is here among us. Within us, around us, us. The Spirit is here to strengthen us. The Spirit is here to move us. The Spirit is here to unite us. Let us worship God.
Not to have our worst confirmed, but to have our best set free. Let us pray for God's grace and pardon by praying together the Unison Prayer of Confession, which is printed in the bulletin. Almighty God, you poured out your Spirit upon gathered disciples, creating bold tongues, open ears, and a new community of faith. We confess that we hold back the force of your Spirit among us. We do not listen for your word of grace, speak the good news of your love, or live as a people made one in Christ. Have mercy on us, O God. Transform our lives by the power of your Spirit and fill us with a desire to be your faithful people in this world, doing your will for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Now continue with your own prayers of confession in silence. The Spirit blows into our lives as either a gentle breeze or a roaring wind. With the Spirit comes forgiveness and empowerment, igniting the fire of hope and possibility in our lives. Friends, hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. God called us to live in unity. Let us now share the peace of Christ with one another. Have a seat and all the kids can come down. Have a spot on the find a spot on the floor as well as your little pew. You're already there. All right, I have a couple things here today I want to show you. First of all, stay there. Don't move. Good bear. A few weeks ago, I was given a wonderful dandelion bouquet by one of my beautiful daughters, yes, Emma Catherine. And out of curiosity, I left the beautiful bouquet of then great bright uh, flowers uh, in my study, 
to see what would happen to the dandelions. Look what's happened to them. Woo. Look at them. Just look. <laughs> no, clear. What do you think? What happened to them? Raise your hand if you know what happened. Well, something changed in them. They're not bright yellow anymore. What are they, Taishé? They're fuzzy things now. Yeah, still dandelions. But what happened to the bright yellow? That part shivered up, and now they're all bushy. Now, if I blew really hard, which I'm not going to do, don't worry. If I did, what would happen to them? Will? The seeds would go everywhere. Yeah. What would you say, Randy? We'd get more dandelions in my yard. We'd get more dandelions in my yard, says Mooney. Exactly. On our webpage... For this whole series on the spirit, we have a picture of a dandelion like this that's become fuzzy and it's getting blown by an unseen force, which is the wind. Just like that unseen force, the spirit moves in us and it spreads all over the place. So that's an, a reminder of the spirit. Today we're going to be talking about the spirit again. How many of you had fun last week at the Pentecost service when you were wearing red? Yes. Yes. Is, uh, is this bear red? Yes. In fact, oh, did get any red on there? Red bear. He's cute, isn't he? I'm going to pass him around. I want you to hug him and then pass him on to your next friend. He likes hugs. But when do we usually see red bears with hearts on them? Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Is it February? Nope. It's June. Why do we have a red bear with a heart? Pass him on. He likes to share his hugs. Why would I have that today? We talked about the Spirit spreading through an unseen force. Is Pentecost one time a year? Well, we celebrate it at one worship service a year. But just like this guy really enjoyed getting hugs from you in the middle of June, Pentecost is all year long. And this nice fellow was given to me by one of our lovely church members. And even though it's not Valentine's Day, I felt a special love and appreciation for the gift. So all year long, all the time, the Spirit's moving us, spreads unseen force, and all year long, the Spirit encourages us to love one another. Okay? You remember that? It's not just limited to once a year. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for changing us, just like those wonderful physical reminders that we have in our head, the, the dandelions that change from one form to another and then spread. We change, and the spirit of you moves through us to many, many others, some of which we never know the impact we make. Thank you for these children and the way that they impact your love of others. Help them to give others hugs today, just like the bear, and help them, in so doing, to be your love in this world that needs it so much. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Spirit. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We pray all of this in Christ's name. And all God's kids said, Amen. This morning's scripture lesson is John chapter 15, verse 12 through chapter 16, verse 1, which can be found on page 1147 of the Pew Bible, as well as projected on the wall. Before we read God's word, let us pray. Loving God, quicken our hearts again, that we may receive your word afresh and anew. 
Send us the refreshing wind of your spirit upon us that your voice may be heard in our hearts and your presence seen in all that we say and do. Amen. Beginning with John chapter 15, verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, <clears throat> that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the Spirit Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. This is the word of the Lord. A special happy Father's Day to all of you fathers this morning in honor of my dad. I'm wearing his first robe that he gave to me. Let us pray together. Holy God that does quicken our hearts, we thank you so much for your spirit. We pray that even as we've heard the word that it has woken us or reawoken us and that in this time we'll once again hear the word through my mouth to our ears. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. It's about the spirit, right? It's all about the spirit. Maybe you think I'm confused in that Last week I put together a Pentecost sermon because I wasn't used to not preaching and I'm just doing it now. No, that's not the case. Although I'll admit there were some times throughout the week where I kept going, I'm forgetting something. I know I'm, because I didn't preach. No, no, that's not it. Actually, I created this sermon for this week because the fact is the spirit of Pentecost is not limited to one Sunday morning in the spring. Today begins the season on the church calendar, if you looked at it, that's called simply, quote, the Sundays after Pentecost, or ordinary time. Now, I've always thought that term was odd, ordinary time, because there's nothing ordinary about our God. He's extraordinary. Amen? Amen. Amen. This spring, we've been learning more and more about the Spirit. We've learned that because of the Spirit, we bless and not bite one another. We're moved through song by the Spirit. We're made generous by the one giver of our many gifts through the Spirit. 
and we're equipped to work through the Spirit. Today we're going to learn how the Spirit helps us to be sacrificial, steady, and spoken. Sacrificial, steady, and spoken. Sacrificial. In being sacrificial, the Spirit moves us to find love, appreciation, tenderness for one another. That someone would lay down his or her life for their friends. It's right here in today's passage. The Spirit of Pentecost was indeed present last week at Nishanik High School. I'm so glad that I saw so many of you there representing First Presby very well in our collection of friends. Later that afternoon, all the pastors received an email from our executive presbyter-elect, the Reverend Dr. Ralph Hawkins, and it was neat to have him there to offer greetings on his first official Sunday as the executive presbyter-elect. And he said this in the email. He said, I am today giving thanks to the Lord Jesus for a good day with good folks in a good place. Come, Holy Spirit, indeed, end quote. Last week, the Spirit united all six churches in song and prayer and word and friendship afterwards. It's truly good and pleasant when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. You all know that psalm from 133, and there's a picture of you doing that. That was right when we were passing the peace. Yet in order, think about this, in order for last week's service to happen, we all sacrificed, in a way, traveling to our normal spaces for worship. Now, I know it's not exactly laying down our lives for one another, but it is laying down our pride. Each of us has stored in historic congregations that we connect that kind of history and, and love, many of those, to our sanctuaries. And so we all compromised on the location. And in doing so, we all gained. We experienced the spirit of Pentecost by being sacrificial in nature. God willing, we'll gather again next year with our Newcastle Presbyterian friends on Pentecost Sunday. Save the date. It will be a little earlier next year, May 24th, 2015. The site will be to be determined. The Spirit not only is sacrificial, moves us to be sacrificial in actions, but it also is steady. It helps us to be steady, even as it's steady. It's always present. It connects us with the one who is despised and rejected by men. Friends, then, despite the trials that we face, the Spirit helps us to stay steady. Despite the trials that we face, the Spirit helps us to stay steady. This section in this Gospel of John about the hatred of the world was written over and against a backdrop of hatred to the early church. Persecution was expected. The Christian church in the first century struggled for survival. Being martyred for one's faith, dying for it, literally, was common. In this setting, it would have felt like, truly, every day, that the world was hating the believers. Our mission partners in the South Sudan nowadays, as well as China, North Korea, and Egypt, and on and on, we could go on and on, no doubt, have all come to experience hatred from the world in the parts of the world that they live. We Christians in the United States need to be cautious of over-exaggerating our oppression. We're not oppressed, not like them. To put this in perspective, do you ever wonder whether or not to like not just a page on Facebook, but a Christian page? Probably not. You might run through your head, oh, should I like this or make a comment on this? 
that's non-Christian, but I'm talking, have you ever wondered whether to like a Christian advertisement or encouragement on Facebook? Probably not. Well, believe it or not, in Egypt, a page dedicated to Muslim converts to Christianity called the Knights of the Cross was simply liked. That's it. Pressed the like button by a 29-year-old Egyptian man who had been Muslim and had converted to Christianity, and problems followed. Last week, he was charged with breaking a law in Egypt of showing, quote-unquote, disdain for another religion. Think about that for just a minute. For showing disdain for another religion just by pressing like. When local authorities showed up at his house, it was wrecked, trashed. The Muslim men who had wrecked it, trashed it, were allowed to go on their way peaceably. And he was put in jail for liking a page on Facebook. Friends, despite persecutions, the spirit of Pentecost is steady. The practical question for us, any of us, wherever we live, is this. How are we going to remain steady in our faith when it feels like the world hates us? How do we do it? There's not one answer to this question. Each Christian community has their own worldview on how, or rather that influences how they deal with one another. Some communities of faith are world-embracing, seeing the world as equally fallen, but worth working with to bring about his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. In this view, the church is a source of ongoing support for persons of, or programs of all worthwhile causes. Little concern is made of partnering with non-church groups, world embracing. Other faith communities are world suspecting, cautiously entering into it, but expecting its views to be at odd, odds rather with their own. The church is seen as a refuge away from the religiously ambivalent secular society. And persons of faith in that worldview support and promote only those causes that they consider biblical, world-suspecting. Other worldviews are world-rejecting. Having experienced such harm from interacting with others in their part of the world, that they encourage believers to completely disengage entirely from public life and seek safety only with one another alone. Sometimes even those environments in which such believers find themselves are so threatening to their faith that even within their families, they have to hide their faith from one another because even within their own family, somebody may totally disagree with them and bring them harm. If we polled Christians in the United States as to their Christian worldview, we'd probably find all three perspectives, world embracing, world suspecting, and world rejecting. In fact, I put this to the test. I love going down to our recreation center and leading their Bible study. I do this once a month with the wonderful, mostly older uh, senior citizen women and men from our community that come here and enjoy our fellowship together. And I went in thinking, all right, this is going to mess it up. I'm going to go and see if this is going to work. But they're all kind of a one age generation. They're all going to think the same thing. What do you think they did when I asked them what their Christian worldview was? And I outlined to each three. They came up with three. There was at least three there. And there were some others who agreed with all three. Whew. So it's true. But even, even in that limited, if you will, poll, non-official uh, poll, this was true. And I think that would be true of us too. That all three of us at one, or all three of these versions of worldviews would be present at one time or another 
in our own lives. Let me suggest then, friends, that given circumstance, any given circumstance, as a Christian in the United States can find themselves in each of these outlooks, world embracing, suspecting, or rejecting. Our own church body is no exception. Consider just these three. This July, second week of July, so heads up if you're interested in helping with this, the fireworks festival, which is going to be right downtown, we in this church are going to wear our His Light in the City t-shirts. We're going to volunteer. We're not going to have our own independent booth, but rather the outreach committee has decided it makes sense if, if we, as a part of the downtown, would come down and support the activity to make it a safe and family-friendly event for all in the downtown here in Newcastle. As we reinforced two weeks ago, we're downtown church that cares for its community. Yet some, some would see these mostly civic actions as a form of world embracing. Oh, you're not going out of your way to tell people to come to First Presbyterian. No, we're not. We're going to be seen as equal partners in our community here in Newcastle, world embracing. But this coming next week at Vacation Bible School, we're going to partner again with Clenmore Presbyterian Church just up the hill to offer witness to the gospel in a world, sadly, that's becoming increasingly less aware of it. The theme is the fruits of the Spirit. And in reinforcing the fruits of the Spirit, many of the object lessons in this curriculum describe the conflict that is in the world today that we experience when we try to be any of them loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, good, faithful, gentle, or self-controlled. If you will, that, that form of teaching at a church property away from the public eye could suggest a kind of world-suspecting model of Christian education. For many persons, then finally, the, in this uh, different perspectives, many of you who maintain a traditional view on marriage, living in an ever-changing culture creates in us a world-rejecting Attitude. We don't agree with the way that even our own commonwealth has changed its way of looking at marriage. And so, here we are in the midst of the world. We find it increasingly difficult to engage in a conversation, even here in the church, about this topic. And so many find it more helpful discussing controversial issues such as marriage and what you see as appropriate or not in defining marriage. You discuss it in private, if at all. This is a world-rejecting attitude. Those three ways are the ways in which Christians can remain steady when it feels like the world hates us. Finally, then, the Spirit is spoken. It bears witness about Jesus Christ, and it calls us to bear witness. That's the way the passage ended today. The words that we share with one another matters, friends. Similar to the disciples, we are not permitted to be passive. We're not. We are called to deliver his message. The Spirit empowers us to speak out and speak up. The Spirit empowers us to speak out, speak up. Our speech can be prayers for those being persecuted in faraway lands and those who are in need in our own backyard. All victims of domestic violence, abandonment, or assault of any kind need to know the love of God. If we turn our back on the ones that we know are in need, we're no better off than those in a faraway land that persecute Christians out of ignorance. Speak out and speak up. Throughout his ministry, Jesus was very candid about the social consequences that came with discipleship. We are to step into the gap with persons who are suffering and recognize that such messiness 
follows the pattern of his life. A servant is not greater than his master. This scripture also reinforces. Indeed, he's the master and we are to serve him. In all the messiness of life, we are to serve him. Unlike some, we have the luxury of living in a nation that permits free speech, yet sadly, many are not comfortable speaking about God to others. What's going on here? I wonder why some have little problem expressing political opinions openly to others. That's one portion of our freedoms. But they shy away from speaking their faith life and making it more than a ritual. I wonder. Admittedly, freedom of speech and the freedom of practicing religion allows for some strange demonstrations. It does. But it also allows, friends, Christians to openly bear witness about Jesus Christ. We have this freedom. Are we living out our lives as Jesus desired, bearing witness to the Father who sent him and living according to his teachings? Are we doing it? Or are we allowing the fear of what might happen in our government to cripple our daily devotion and discipleship to the Lord? While half a world away, people are being arrested and even killed for their faith in Jesus Christ. The bottom line is this. To be one of his, we must be in the Spirit. And to be in the Spirit, we shall demonstrate a daily discipline of sacrificial, steady, and spoken faith in Jesus Christ alone. Amen? Amen. The Spirit is not limited to one Sunday in the spring. It's embodied through you and through me all year long. Whenever we sacrifice our pride, bear with one another, and we speak about Jesus in word and in deed, we are following the Spirit of God. Pentecost, and there's nothing ordinary about that. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus
compassion and grace, a heart that your spirit fills. May I show forgiveness and mercy the same way you've shown it to me. Do I communicate your love and your grace? Do I reflect who you are in the way I choose to be? Do they see Jesus? Jesus in me. Well, I want to show all the world that you are the reason I live and breathe. So you'll be the one that they see when they Do I communicate your love and your grace? Do I reflect who you are in the way I choose to be? Oh, do they see? Jesus in me. Friends, this is the Lord's table, and you are invited to partake with the Lord. All baptized believers in Jesus Christ are welcome to together celebrate the sacrament. We include gluten-free crackers in the bread trays so that all may fully participate. And in case you didn't know it, that's the history behind the juice, too. Both the United Methodist and the Presbyterians always offer juice, not wine, so as to keep any from temptation who may have challenges in that area. This table is the Lord's. You are the Lord's people. And even as one day we'll be gathered together, together at table, in God's place, We'll be breaking bread and eating drink, or drinking drink. We'll be together, even in that time. So to here, in this place, this is a foretaste of that kingdom, of that heavenly feast which is to come. And so we balance this sacred time between the celebration that it is, the joy, the excitement, and also the sacredness, the meaning, the depth. Scripture tells us that if we take unworthily, that this is to our own detriment. So even as you are joyfully and openly, all of you who are baptized believers, to celebrate together, we also say cautiously, take this and think about it. And allow even that spirit that I've been preaching about and will continue to preach about 
to stir within you and see what happens. Good things, friends. Good things. Let's pray together. Holy God, just up the road, north and a little bit of west of here, at the 221st General Assembly, Presbyterians are gathering and having Holy Communion together. They are bound and connected by the same Spirit that connects all of us here today. And they worship the same Jesus Christ that gives all of them, as you do all of us, salvation. We pray that even as our church's General Assembly convenes, that both the power as well as the peace of the Holy Spirit would be present even as Cindy's spoken of today. That people would see Jesus in one another. That their decisions would reflect you and not just their own agendas. And that we, regardless of their decisions, would see Jesus in one another and reflect you and not our own comfort or our own opinions as we love one another. It's a messy world, Lord Jesus. You know that. But it's always been and always will be. And yet you call us into the very middle of the mess because you love us enough to give us, all of us fallen, not perfect people, your grace, a grace that overcomes all bitterness, all tensions, and gives us a brand new beginning. In you, Lord Jesus, we pray for unity. And we pray that your spirit here at First Presbyterian of Newcastle would empower us to do what you want us to do because we're a downtown church that cares for its community. We lift up today all of those who hurt or all of those who have been hurt. We lift up those who are traveling or all of those who will travel. All of those that are far away from us or even though they're not, they feel that far from us. All of those that we've lost in the last year to death or sickness, and all of those that you want to gain as those who would devote their lives to you. We pray all of this, Lord Jesus, in the name of the one that taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, these words I give you as it's been passed down to me, says the Apostle Paul, and says your pastor, that on the night in which Christ was betrayed, he took bread. And after he had given thanks for it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, this is my body, which has been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup. Pouring it out, he said, this is my blood, which has been shed for you, the remission of all of your sins. This is the new covenant for all of you. Then friends, every time that we eat the bread and we drink of the cup. 
we proclaim the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, the messiness of it all, and his sacrifice for us, his resurrection into glory, until he comes back in glory. These, friends, are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Let us celebrate this sacrament together. body of Christ, broken for you.
The blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray together. Holy God, in a special way, in a spirit filled way, you've connected us here this morning. In prayer, in song, in word, and now indeed in partaking together in this sacrament, which you set apart and you told us to do with fellow believers. We thank you for filling us by the power of the Holy Spirit with a spiritual, real connectivity to one another. And now we pray, even as we go from this place, that we would indeed be closer to you as we walk with you, with one another. In Christ's name, our Savior always. Amen.
friends, you've heard the message of good news, of hope, of reassurance despite the way that it feels like some days that the world hates you. But Jesus knew that. He knew it even as he created it. He felt the hate even before you existed. He saw the brokenness even as he had used his own abilities to create it perfect. And we did it. We, the human race, did it, broke it, messed it up. And then something happened. He came and he said, yeah, you did it. But let me give you hope. Let me give you a chance. Let me give you grace. Let me give you a spirit that's going to encourage you despite what you've done. I love you enough to give you not just a way out, but a way through the difficulties of life. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, we have that grace, friends. And so now, we go live it. None of us knows when that last day is going to come, when he returns with great trumpet sound. None of us knows when our own last day comes. But we know who created our days, and we know who created our praise. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you today and always. Amen.